Welcome to IEP Radio, a show dedicated to the education of all things indoor environmental quality related. And now here's your host, Michael Schrantz. Hello, everybody, and welcome to IEP Radio. This is Episode 6. Today, we're going to be talking about the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness, or ICE, and uh, getting a better understanding of how IC helps us connect the dots between uh, the health of the patient and the health of our homes. And to help get that job done, I've invited our special guest, Dr. Mary Ackerley, who will be with us here shortly. Wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, Mary. She is a classically trained board certified psychiatrist. Uh, she is a summa cum laude graduate of Harvard University. Uh, she has uh, studied at the National Institute of Mental Health and finished her residency at San, uh, Johns Hopkins and was certified in psychiatry and neurology. She holds active medical licenses in Arizona and Florida, and really important to today's podcast, she is one of the co-founders of IC, which is incredible because uh, beyond uh, the fact that I am also a board member, she really was there uh, from the ground up, and uh, she's been an amazing um, friend, uh, colleague, mentor uh, in my life, in my practice, and really has just changed my view on even how to approach uh, assessments, uh, patients, how to, how to work with them, talk with them, and get an idea of chronic illness uh, because it's complicated, right? It's not just simply pointing at uh, some sort of an exposure that you can see, say, remediate that, and everyone's life gets uh, better. And Mary is uh, the, the perfect person for the other side of this, the, the medical side. She's an integrative holistic physician. She specializes in natural uh, treatments. She, she commonly sees patients um, uh, who, who suffer from anxiety, depression, brain fog, chronic fatigue. Uh, her skills include the ability to manage cognitive and psychiatric symptoms often found in complex chronic illness, protocols for biotoxin illness, um, which may involve conventional and integrative medical treatment. I mean, the list goes on and on uh, for her and I'm truly honored to have the opportunity to speak with her today. Welcome to the show, Mary. Hey, Mike. It's really nice you invited me to be on it. Ah, oh, you're welcome. Uh, this is going to be an absolute joy and pleasure today. I, I get this question right off the bat, what's ICE? And I know that uh, I'm a board member, but you've really been there since its inception. So I figured we'd pose that question to you to see if you could do a, a good job describing what ICE is and what its purpose and mission. Absolutely. Um, I've been involved absolutely since the beginning, which I think was February 2017, along with Sonia Rappaport and Keith Bernstein. Um, there were several other people along the way, but there, there are challenges. You're founding something new. It hasn't existed before. Um, and as our vision clarified, um, other people found that it wasn't really quite their vision. So, so we went on. It was the three of us meeting every week, hammering out what is our who are we? What is even our name? Our name is International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness. And international is meaningful. We have members in Canada, England, and Australia, as well as the US. And as you know, we're growing very rapidly. I expect more um, countries to be involved since this is a global um, issue. Um, it's society. It's actually a professional society. Um, we have founded that, um, that until we educate professionals um, to recognize and treat environmentally acquired illness, we really don't serve patients. So our, one of our major focuses really is educating um, healthcare providers. And that's more than doctors. Doctors are really important. It certainly is DOs, of course naturopaths, um, but some of the ancillary services too for, um, would be chiropractic and op um, optometrists. So nurse practitioners, very much a part is everybody who's seeing patients, we want them to have a blueprint for recognizing what we're talking about and having tools to treat it. So it's a professional society and it's nonprofit. Um, we're not making money um, from what we sell or do. And it means, I think, that the advice we give um, may be more factual and true. It's not biased um, towards making a financial profit. Environmentally acquired, what does that mean? Well, at first it was mold. 
it was going to be about mold because there's really no professional society for mold. And that's certainly, Mike, how far do you and I go back in Tucson? 2011, yeah, right. 2012, long time. That feels time. about right. Yeah, that feels right. About right. It's, it's, you know, going on nine years or so. So we've worked together a long time and it's been about mold. And um, I, you know, you're called an IEP, but I know you mostly more as the mold man. It's, you know, you're investigating it and you're my eyes for what I can't see. And you're helping people actually remediate um, or diagnose what's wrong with their homes. But as time's gone on, it's realized patients are more complicated. Mold is what I call the great catalyst. It sets off uh, just an enormous amount of toxins, little, little buckets and piles of toxins all over the body, all over the home that people have been dealing with until mold comes, completely dysregulates the immune system and the hormone system. And with that combination, besides taking out the brain too, which you know is what I'm most interested in sometimes, um, it leaves just a fertile playground for everything else to start um, showing itself. So Lyme is a big part of this. Ticks are, are in our environment. We can't really stop them. They've been spreading rapidly. It's 300,000 a year that's admitted. Most of us feel there's much more, and it's been going on much longer than any of us know. And in fact, Arizona is a Lyme state. <laughs> and we do have Lyme patients who, as far as we can tell, got it here in Tucson. So um, lots of growth and growing to just include, okay, now it's not just mold, but a lot of these patients have Lyme. And then there's Bartonella, and that's cats, or it's ticks, or it's both. But most people have been scratched by a cat at some point. So it's, it's, these are infections that really influence what's going on. There are gut infections because the gut is so dysregulated in mold. Um, and viruses. But then we open up the real Pandora's box of all the other environmental toxins that people are exposed to every day. Um, the pesticides, um, organophosphates, um, androgen or estrogen um, stimulators um, that are in some of these pesticides and also the chemicals commonly used, not just to clean, but to keep our, um, keep our sofas from bursting out in flames. All of these are part of an indoor environment. And so, okay, so now we have toxins, but then there's heavy metals. So you get it. It's an ever-expanding list. Glyphosates are probably my personal favorite right now of like, oh my goodness, how long has this been going on? That Roundup, again, part of the environment has become a carcinogen. And at this point, three people have each won $80 million for having non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So it's like, well, I thought Roundup was safe. So <laughs> you get the idea. It's, it's, it's not just an epidemic. It's an epidemic that keeps growing as more scientists and, and laymen discover that things they thought okay, like lying on their couch, is actually dangerous in a whole lot of ways. And yep. so um, we have environmentally acquired, and then um, there's illness. So it's inflammation is major, but there's illness. And with that, we're hoping in with an acronym that people can at least remember, ICI, we have a society, but a whole lot has gone into even thinking about that name, getting it registered as a profit, and then developing the vision um, of what is it we want to do. And I think a big thing, because you've certainly been involved in these discussions, is we want a nonprofit society that's non-biased for professionals that um, interacts in respectful manners that includes inclusive views because is something I like to point out on our email list often is there's nobody here who holds you know the answer for any of this there are no double blind controlled studies at all in anything we're talking about that shows that there's only one way to treat this diagnose it um, nor is there any patient really who has only one thing. So what I'm trying to say is that we are really here to teach clinicians, but also then to educate the public and educate the public on an individual level, which is something you do, Mike, every time you walk into a home and point out, did you ever notice like it looked a little moist there or that, you know, that there was some rain that came in during the monsoons, what happened, et cetera. It's education on that level. It's education on the fact that, you know, really you can't get away anymore with eating non-organic um, because of the many things. So um, there's 
education to the public to wake up that their indoor air environments are extremely unsafe in many ways that we all think we have the basics, clean air, clean water, and clean food, yet we can name a number of toxins for each one of those elements that are creating really poor health. So right. what, um, what we say is green is not as green as we thought it was, or as clean, was as clean as we thought it was. No, it's yeah, exactly right. It's like, but I thought that, you know, building, you know, that green building material was supposed to, you know, um, prevent mold. And yeah. that's the Chinese drywall, the green stuff that turns mm -hmm. out to have contained mold, growing most germ is destroying buildings from the inside out. That's one I'm small sorry. example. So there's the vision then of that kind of education in a nonprofit way of letting people be more and more aware that they can't be careless about a lot of this stuff if they want good health. And then there's a research component that we really have a vision too, is when I say we don't have the answers, what's best is we really want those answers. And in fact, we already have a partnership with the University of Arizona School of Public Health. We have the professor teaching a course there on environmentally acquired illness and is she's a member of ICI and in fact, we've already started doing some research on the stuff I'm most interested in neuroquants and hope to expand into other areas. So research is very big, but the vision of all of this is to educate and um, train and make aware a very large amount of people of how toxic the world is, what they can do to heal it in themselves, prevent it from happening again, and possibly even make a difference in changing the way we live so that the world does have clean air, clean water, and clean food. And I think that's the, that's the segue, Mary, because, you know, the old model, uh, speaking for the IEPs out there, um, and certainly we've been called worse, but um, is that we, we came from an industry that was maybe predominantly industrial to begin with. We switched the conversation from mold to chemicals where we look at things that OSHA does to protect health. But when you look at the guidelines and, you know, how much of a, a contaminant, a concentration you can have, it was measured in, you know, uh, exposures in, in terms of hours, like an eight-hour exposure, a, a permissible exposure limit or uh, a 15 minute uh, short term uh, exposure. And that's hardly uh, the chronic exposure concerns that we're talking about, but that's where in my experience, a lot of the, the old dogs of IEPs and even some of today lacking that understanding that, that you don't need to have 20 square feet of visible mold growth or a 50 gallon drum of benzene with the lid off in your living room to constitute an exposure and that anything less than that is just your imagination. The, the, the struggle, um, I think for all of us, certainly the IEPs, because we're not qualified to diagnose from a health perspective, we try to find sources in homes using the, the tools and talents that we can bring, um, is that it, you said it earlier, no one has the, I'll use it a cheat sheet. No one has a, a secret uh, formula that says, well, based off of the age of your home and your blood type, um, you're allowed to be exposed to, uh, to use a generic ex uh, example, 14 spores of, of mold X. But if it was 15 spores, your arm's going to fall off. Right. And it's, it's invited a couple things, uh, a, a realization that there's a lot more going on than we knew. Your chemical and roundup uh, points you made earlier are fine examples of that. And, and also beg that need for education and collaboration because people are making very costly decisions with their health and their home to avoid exposure. Right. Um, absolutely. I think just going back to even the first point is we're always dealing with the argument, the dose is the poison. It just doesn't apply anymore. The amount of poisons we're exposed to in small amounts, but multiple amounts of these poisons is a very different model than you have your 50 gallons of benz benzene and you've just you know inhaled it for two hours now you're sick and so um there's also the idea that the body excretes this stuff and that's pretty mistaken in a lot of places too is not just you're exposed that you can get rid of it is some of this stuff can be hanging around like lead from childhood it didn't go anywhere so it just, things just keep getting added on. So 
um, it's the complexity, it's the inflammation, it's the chronic complex illness that we see in so many different ways now from children with allergies, asthma, and autism. I think the last statistic I read is one in 35 kids have autism. It's so common that we just use the word quirky and there are different, different varieties of quirky. Um, but it's really not that cute, and it's an enormous burden on parents and on society to educate, train, and to essentially what one parent said, it's like I'm reverse engineering my child back to what he should have had when he was born. Yeah. And I believe most of it is environmental. Um, there's a Harvard professor who now says women shouldn't breastfeed their, the common toxic levels of a, um, of a childbearing woman are so high now that they're a toxic danger That's to scary. children. That's really scary. And I can't believe it doesn't get more play. Um, that that's how bad it is and how bad autism is. So it's most, there are many, most of the people I see can ignore it. We want to educate those people who still have the luxury of pretending this isn't happening. And right. certainly my work with you brings that in. Actually, there's one thing I do want to just bring up is you got to check out a story came out in the New York, I think the last few days, actually my chiropractor secretary just told me, to you, I read in the New York and thought right about you. And it's like, what, is it one of the crazy psych cartoons there? No, it was, it's a story on how toxic Thanksgiving is. Really good. It's, have you seen it yet? No, but it's like, okay, now we're, we're, we're attacking Thanksgiving. I'm afraid to know what, 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 what no, we're, we're not attacking Thanksgiving. We're simply documenting a bunch of grad students in Texas who just, but, you know, using just particle meters, you know, of particulates, CO2, benzene, VOCs, document the indoor air as they did the typical things with baking, using toasters, oh. ovens, gas stoves, keeping the windows closed, how much, how toxic it came to the level where it was, um, would be considered a danger if it were outdoor. Even from, they, yeah, right. Even, I was to say, even through the eyes of the EPA, which helps control outdoor and even through like more of an industrial feel for short term. And gee, are, we're, are we really that surprised that that many people working in a closed door box, building up these contaminants, which we loosely say are things that your body doesn't like, get to a level of concentration it's just a paradigm shift. It's an appreciation. Whereas back, you know, decades ago, we just passed off whatever symptoms you were having as just having a bad day at work, take a couple Tylenol or aspirin. And, and now you, and from your side of the fence, you're, you see, I don't know where the numbers at hundreds, thousands of, of people who have, uh, are affected by maybe not at Thanksgiving every day, that type of an exposure, but it doesn't have to be just about the foods that we're using or, or the, the devices that we're using in our home that create carbon monoxide or, or other factors. When you combine it together, it's a soup of contaminants that you're being exposed to. And if you're uh, susceptible, if that's the right way of saying that, uh, the penalty is a lot greater than somebody who can otherwise be in that type of environment. Right. Also, a long time ago, um, we used to open the windows a lot more. Yeah. And not worry so much about the cost of energy. Opening the windows would have done a lot. It right. was the closing the windows and keeping it energy efficient while then generating all this particulate and VOC right. that led to the toxicity. So um, I just think you might find it an interesting article exactly about the soup. And they weren't even measuring mold or anything right. exotic. You know, you bring up, you, I'm glad you brought up not just that story, but a, a reminder that what you've done now twice about the fact that we're not just looking at mold, because you're absolutely right. On one hand, you can argue um, that mold is a great surrogate for other uh, biocontaminants where perhaps uh, moisture uh, is the catalyst, uh, water damage, water leaks. Um, you could argue that you can test for other things like bacteria, but you get into to, um, great discussions, but good debates about you know, the value of that test and a lot of people are stuck. So it, it's about figuring out though, that while we were testing for mold, it, there's other things, there's off gassing of materials, whether it's the formaldehyde from the new cabinets, whether it's um, uh, occupant lifestyle, the example you used in the article that was out a few days ago um, and, uh, and coming to a, appreciate that on one end, I feel, I feel like there's that struggle. So for those that are listening 
um, it's, it's this idea of on one hand, it's getting away from the acute, the obvious problem that you can see in order to justify an exposure. On the far other end, we, we deal with the struggles of extremeness and dealing with um, uh, the reaction uh, that we hear from society or from even patients and trying to find that balance of how far do we go with um, a, a, a great example is, you know, a lot of times when uh, people are sick and they do some of their own sampling, they don't know how to um, interpret it or maybe it's really not that bad, but they go on some social media group, they, they kind of hear the fear factor approach and they panic. And so there's this, there's a concern on the other end of the spectrum, which is that there's a big fear factor approach here. And that's causing a lot of, um, um, it's causing a lot of uprivaling of people. They don't know what to do. Everyone has to sell their home. Everyone needs to burn all their clothes. And I don't know that that's the solution either. The struggle for me now is trying to figure out how do we achieve that balance? How do we meet in the middle? I don't think that everyone needs to necessarily be living uh, in a high desert in a tent as a solution. You no, because it's a not lot. a great solution. I mean, tents still have off gassing. <laughs> right. <I'm serious>. No <laughs> yeah. And there are a lot of allergens and pollens right. in the air, too. And True. we all need, on another level, we need a sense of safety, which most of us don't have in a tent anymore. And we all need a sense of community. And again, that's hard. So um, I, I believe family and community are important. So isolating oneself in tents and going from hotel to hotel room causes damage too. I like right. to point that out as well as just avoiding endless minute amounts of spores. Right. So I think you and I've talked about this is that, um, yes, there is a wide spectrum. On one hand, we're trying to wake up people like, hello, maybe after Thanksgiving, you're not falling asleep just because you ate too much turkey, right. but because the gas carbon monoxide was too high too. Trying to wake up a lot of people of do it so you don't fall into the group that you and I see, which is increasing and increasing, um, of people who are so sick that their brains don't work very well, their bodies don't work, they're clearly sick by any, anyone's measure, um, even if we don't have the tools or diagnostic codes to always cleanly say, this is what you have. There it is, right there. It's, it's tip of the spear, it's, a, it's, a, it's being transparent and realizing that this isn't this is it, folks. This is a group of professionals uh, that I have seen. Uh, and it's not just clinicians. We have a wonderful group of uh, environmental professionals, folks like myself working together, uh, trying to work together with the, on the clinical side. Uh, you know, what can we do in the field to help answer questions for the clinician and the client, that sort of thing. And I, I'm glad that you're talking about diet because, you know, even talking with other folks like uh, Chris Kresser and others, you know, we know that your diet could be a big part of, of your, your total effect on your body and your health. And what I love about IC's group and organization is that they don't appear to have tunnel vision and quite literally it's the opposite. It's, it's going, I think we're spending too much time chasing a spore. Not that, not that there's times where uh, a mold exposure and arguably probably in a lot of water damaged building, there's something to, to be said about that. I can certainly speak from experience, but to not be so closed minded that there might be something else going on and that it's not just the M word that we're worried about. It's very, it truly is a holistic approach uh, right. from the inside of your body out. Yeah. M is Mrs. O'Leary's cow. It's, it's the mold word, the M word. It's, yeah. It knocks over the bucket of all the other accumulated toxins. I've never seen a person get, well, I shouldn't say never, um, probably 95% of people I get well or work with have to do multiple things to get well besides just get out of mold and pull it out of them. Right. Um, they have to fix their gut. They have to fix their brain. They have to get their immune system. They have to put infections um, back into being more closely regulated by their immune system um, and many other things. And I think one thing that Mike and I talk about a lot is because you're great at diagnosing mold and you're also pretty good at saying this house looks okay. And there are people who find it very hard to ever be reassured that a home could be okay for them. And that's the place where um, Mike and I will talk is the work um, that I do, um, which I work a lot with the brain. I'm a psychiatrist. As we know, we all have a limbic system. But as on neuroquants, 
um, which is a volumetric measurement of gray and white matter in the brain. We look at about 50 regions in the brain and you can see a lot of things. I can see who's had TBIs that never knew it, another environmental um, acquired. When my, you and I grow up, well, I'm older than you. When I grow up, if you were breathing, when you got up, nothing happened. It was right. over, right? <laughs> so, well, it wasn't a TBI. It was like, you got up. That's life, kid. Keep going. Um, and you can see on the neuroquant damage really from 50 years ago, when people have had multiple TBIs and football sports, we know now they do enormous damage to their brain. Right. So you have that compounded with the fact that you're inhaling mold and you're healing other contaminants. And I think Keith Bernstein has just done a great job of showing, you know, the 30 things that are in a water damaged building. So when we talk about mold, I've always said it's just the cheapest and easiest to measure. We can't measure the fungal spores and the VOCs so easily and the bacteria, et cetera. Although you started to measure some of the bacteria, I think, Mike. Certainly, but it's, not, it's, it, on it's an art beyond the science and, and, and it's, it's, you have to know how far you're able to really say something with confidence. And at the end of the day, I don't just couple any decision off of a bacteria sample. I'm combining it to what, what we know about their health. And that's where the clinician comes into play, which is why this is such a powerful relationship. Right. Is I always tell people, I really trust your findings, what you say. And I've learned to read behind between the lines too. I think um, you can tell people things and they may want to hear one thing and it can be very hard to reassure them it's okay, or you may tell them it's not okay and they don't want to hear it. You can tell them nine times and they'll still tell me, but he said it's okay. Yeah, and I'll read the that. report and said, Willie doesn't look okay. <laughs> you sure? Or he said it. Well, he said we might have to do more testing or something. And I'm looking, that's a lot of stacky there. You know? yeah. um, so that's, that's the kind of I've learned over the years to read what you've said, know you, and then know what the patient's interpretation is in between, because both of us have the goal of getting them healthy, and we have to work together, because mm -hmm. you can't do this on their own as a clinician, and you can't do it as an IEP. That's probably our message through all of this. Yeah. Um, yeah. But going back to just, you can see in the brain a lot of things. You see TBIs, you can see Alzheimer's, unfortunately, and many patients have cognitive, major cognitive issues, major psychiatric issues that are coming from inhalation of the soup through their nose and, hey, guess what's right next to the nose, guys? The brain. And it's a fairly thin barrier. We know bacteria and viruses can easily get through. We know bacteria and virus, a bacteria at least, and fungi grow in the brain. And VOCs can easily get through. And we see a lot of brain symptoms, but we also see a neuroquant a lot of brain abnormalities. So one of the things I see clearly in a group of patients who are not, it's not diagnostic of mold, it's diagnostic of patients whose limbic system is on fire. I mean, it's, it's, we can just call it, these are the real fire patients where the components of their limbic system, the thalamus, which is your pain center, so that's an amplifier, you know sound, so you really have a preamp and an amplifier that are picking up the tiniest sound now and amplifying it into a much bigger sound than it is to other people. Thalamuses are very overactivated. The, um, um, the amygdala, the infamous amygdala, the fear center, the fire alarm. You know, I have a lot of people, 99%, their amygdala is bigger than 99% of like men or women their age. And I see a lot of them. These are the people with the thalamus amplifying the signal, with the amygdala, a fire alarm set to go off for you know just a tiny whiff of smoke that might go through with a hippocampus that's also up there in the 98th, 99th percentile. Hippocampus is memory and emotional memories. So they start getting triggered with emotional memories of other bad things that have happened in their life. And that together with a roadway in the brain that corrects the front of the brain to the back of the brain, the anterior cingulate, all are overactivated, just kind of looping these fearful messages, which again set off fire now through the immune system and through the um, through our nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system. So you start seeing tachycardia, um, you start seeing raised adrenaline, and that keeps it going. So, and, as, and to use the analogy, when we have environmental exposures, is that akin to throwing roadblocks in the way of these connections in the mind? 
it's I, I believe the environmental exposures are what's leading to the overactivation. They're setting off probably mast cells, um, and um, which is the first responders in the immune system that are in the brain, that are in the blood-brain barrier surrounding the brain. They are contributing to edema or to the retention of some of these toxins. So different reasons, different reasons, but there's overactivation. Um, right. So um, at that point, the person is feeling on tilt. I think that's a good word. <laughs> They're on tilt. <laughs> bad one things little, happening. So bad things. Additional thing. Right. This is another thing. And I don't want anything more bad to ever happen to me again. So you can't really reassure them. And this is where I come in, where I will work with different things, particularly with mast cells and supplements and remedies, and also suggesting mind training that helps kind of restore a balance between our emotional parts, our limbic systems, and the frontal, prefrontal part of our brain, which is our most evolutionary advanced part of the brain, which helps us plan, organize, and make decisions are some of the major things it does. And yeah. Restoring that balance tends to bring about a more reasoned discussion, whether it's in the realm of, you know, what is toxic, what is poison, um, where people arguing kind of wild positions and having difficult times seeing gray. No, we can never perfectly assure your safety, but we can say there's a really good chance it looks like that this home is really pretty good. And that's, that's, that's what they need to hear because that's the truth. And I just think with Icy's type of background and knowledge and years of experience and the, the passion that it seems that everybody has on the clinical side can say that, I mean, this is tip of the spear. It's not like there is again, some cheat sheet to go to for all of us. So it's such a wonderful, this is such a wonderful opportunity for, for those of you who are, that are listening, whether you're on the clinical side or you're a patient, or you're just, you've always wondered what was wrong with your husband or whatever the issue was. To, to go on IC's website and, and learn more. And I, I, I want to talk uh, a little bit about, before we, we forget, and I know we won't, but there is so much information, but um, there's this upcoming conference. And uh, Mary, I was hoping you could maybe talk a little bit about that, because if there ever was an opportunity for somebody who was really serious, especially on the clinical side who wants to attend, I would argue this being the inaugural one, this is the one to go to, but it is right around the corner. Right around the corner, and it's literally right around the corner from us too in, in Phoenix, and in a little north of Phoenix in a newly renovated resort um, that is basically setting out to be a budget canyon ranch. So it is um, really a spa-like setting in the desert. Um, and it's meant to be relaxed, and it's meant to foster an inclusive spirit of people who are pioneers together trying to look at a world that keeps seeming more and more toxic um, and to learn to work with patients in ways that probably we don't, I don't use the words right or wrong. It's like, what's the most efficient way here to get this patient better? Right. Um, how, what skills do I have to get them better say in a year and not 10 years? Um, in fact, one of the people involved in a lot of our work with, um, bringing ICI into fruition again, which takes a lot of backstage players, a lot, um, doing different things. You know, recounted the story of her children um, with some major psychiatric symptoms where it took 11 years from like fifth grade to college to get them healthy and well. And of which, you know, it wasn't really like till year four or so they heard about infections and pans and then infections and Lyme. But it's only about two years ago, someone finally mentioned the word mold. And it was, again, the combination of everything that's gotten them well now. My contention, and I would say anyone who's treated patients like this for a while would say, if the mold had been discovered right away, we probably could have cut 11 years down to at least three or four here. Um, right. it's, it's so I think that's our goal is to, um, find efficient ways in sequencing treatments and for clinicians who are interested is if you're seeing patients like I'm describing, like Mike's describing that, you know, they're sick, they're being poisoned in some way. And you're seeing increasing amounts of people coming in who think they have mold, who know they have Lyme and your recipes aren't working this is the place to talk with other people 
in a respectful way where we acknowledge we're all finding our way here, but also learn, hey, here are some people who've done this for a long time, what's worked for them, and where is the research? What are the research questions we can be asking, and how can we get um, people in academics interested in working on this and doing the kind of research that other academics respect and then go to government agencies where they respect this research because that's a really important part of this is bringing everybody on board to work together to get the message out these these patients are real and their issues are real and we need the research and we need the clinicians um, and we need the population and at some point hopefully some sort of political clout, to be honest, that would give us a clout um, to bring real information to people who can make change um, on much bigger levels and platforms in government. So I'd say that ICI is looking at this as being a major leader in promoting the kind of education and work, and that includes the IEPs. You know that as okay, we know what the EPA says now, we know it's very outmoded for what's really going on, and how do we get that kind of research that takes into the complexity with the patients we're seeing to support, hey, it would be lovely if you could walk around with the magic wand in each room and just get a reading where it went, you know, blue, great, you know, yellow, eh, you know, could do a little work, and then green, you know, and then red, oh, let's run out into the next room. That kind of right. little magic wand where we all agreed scientifically we knew what we were doing. That would yeah. be a dream a long time from now, but I think you know what I'm talking about is no, having even, that having, certainty. Having that sort of a certainty I, I don't see in the foreseeable, fu uh, the foreseeable future, which is why I also uh, appreciated you saying that you really do have, uh, this has been such a warm, really a sense of family with the IC members uh, because there's an embracement. Uh, it, everyone knows they're in, in, in certain areas, there's, it's, it's charted territory. In other ways, it's uncharted territories. And for those of you who are like, eh, I'm going to go to the source, you're going to find yourself right back here. Uh, this is the source. These are the brightest minds, uh, some of the brightest minds, and they're always looking for more to to get that united voice so that there is more clout, there is a little bit more uh, political representation. It's no different than an IEP saying, we wish that this had enough influence to affect your local building codes so that we can build our homes smarter um, <laughs> from the building materials, which you could can compare to as human diet to, uh, the fr uh, to mechanical ventilation uh, and exposure, that sort of thing. We, we need that, but you know, I, this is going to come to a shock to a lot of people that sometimes people are led by greed and money and that sometimes your health uh, is left you know, in the dust. And so it's going to take a powerful movement. It's going to take, um, take constant um, uh, rehashing the same issues until it becomes such an obvious issue I mean, how long ago, how long was it before ago uh, where Marlboro cigarettes or whoever you know they smoked it? It was a positive thing. Was the marketing down? It was you know to help you de-stress, and you know it took years, but eventually they they had to force themselves to say it could cause cancer, you know, and you know they were reluctant to you know tr make the wording just right to where they weren't fully completely liable, but they could there could have been a risk, and and now everybody knows that you probably shouldn't smoke cigarettes. And my, my dad got lung cancer 30 years after smoking kind of a thing and everyone's surprised. This is what this organization is trying to prevent. Uh, for those of you listening, they're trying to prevent that story or they're trying to correct it so that you have a higher utility, a better quality of life that you recover in, in more of that model that Mary mentioned of a year or two versus never or versus 10 years. And these are the people that have learned the hard way and these are the people who have networked with folks with that experience to say, okay, let's try that. Let's see if this helps the patient. Um, I've never seen a group of individuals work together so efficiently in my life. And I realize I'm not 150 years old yet, but I'm, I've been actively involved in a lot of different associations. And it's a great way for those uh, to get started. You don't have to love for you to join, be a part of IC to different capacities, but if you can make it, it's not just for clinicians, um, also IEPs, remediation companies, uh, those who have serious interest in working with people who have chronic illness, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if it's been opened up or ever will be to the general public. I, I, I don't know, Mary, if, that's, if I put you on the spot it's, with that. or No, it's, it's, we, we serve to exist 
as a professional society, which means we give certification and accreditation that the public will need to make their own arm. And they, they do have some with mold, but I think they need one as broad reaching as ICI in environmental toxicity to continue the fight perhaps more than we can. Um, but so we do have, again, our, our mandate, our charter is nonprofit and professional. But professionals include an awful lot of people seeing the public. And so um, getting, and many clinicians have joined because their patients said, you know, you really need to, you know, check out ICI and figure out what's going on if you want to learn how to treat me. And I love looking at this map because it started out, I'd guess, you know, with Keith in Chicago and Sonia in North Carolina and me in Tucson. There were three. Right. Right. <laughs> and we right. now have people all around the world, which I'm proud of saying, but certainly many, many more people now um, throughout the US and in Canada. We have a cluster of people in Canada. There used to be one, I think they're now about 10. Right. Um, and, and Australia, which recently fought and got their legislature to win. Um, they're parliament to say that SIRS needs to be recognized and deserves research. Right. So exactly. um, having something like that happen here all of these are things that can happen as more and more people get educated and a lot more smart people do what's needed to address the complexities. That's the problem for IEPs. It is just not as simple as we're looking at particulate or we're looking at a VOC or we're looking at mold spores. It's right. just not that easy. No. And it's to address the complexity makes the experiments much harder, but that's the reality. And until some of that's done, we still have an ICI stands as saying this is wrong and shouldn't happen. We have the whole legal system, usually insurers who don't want to give disability for these illnesses um, and landlords who don't want to clean up the messes. And it is so much easier to just say, this is not a problem. You know, you'll need to find another place. This didn't make you ill. Or basically, where I find a lot of people is, you're psychiatric. This is all in your head, of which we usually like to hold up the neuroquat and say, yeah, it is in my head, in my brain, quite right. real. It's like saying a stroke is all in your head. Right. It's, it's kind of saying the obvious, you know? So um, that's the that's place where I see us going, where... Um, you know, reasonable people avoid the dangers for themselves as best they can, learn to not buy homes as like, oh, this is such a bargain. The roof is leaking. The windows are leaking. Oh, I can fix that, you know, and we, we can pump out the water in the basement, learn to like, leave it. You probably can't fix it. <laughs> and, right. you know, to stop those kind of mistakes from happening or from like, oh, yeah, we can eat, you know, food that's just been desiccated by glyphosates because the government says it's safe. Okay. Yeah. You know, doctors used to say, Hey, I smoke and I'm fine. You know, right. there you so, have it. <laughs> doctors, the governments can be very wrong. And what um, we're doing is to work with the people, the professionals who can get certified, have the public recognize who's telling them the truth as best they see it versus those who are gaslighting them that it's not an issue. And, oh, that, that water leak is not a problem. We fixed it. Don't worry. In Arizona, it all dries out. Yeah. What are we that's, fixing that's the still country? In every thing with yeah. me, Mary. Still in everyday right. thing I get. It was me, too. I just sent you someone else who, you know, their roof has been leaking, you know, for 24 years. And um, some they got someone to come and say that they thought the home was okay. And I said, you're really pretty sick here. And I just don't think you really got to talk to my kind of thing. He's going to say this house is we, okay. We, yeah, we, and we see that a lot. And for those of you listening, I know we were talking about, you know, how IC can help um, transitioning into, you know, some of you listening don't know where to start. And um, there's, there's, there's other podcasts on IEP radio that talk about more specific uh, topics. I'm getting ready to do a podcast in a couple of weeks on home inspection basics and things to consider when renting, which is right up Mary's 
uh, 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 topics that she brought things up. Things to not do, right? right? Just, just you know, the big things that maybe not so obvious to the layman, but just know that IC is a great resource as well. This map is a, I'm a visual person, so this is wonderful for me, for me as well, but you have a lot of people here as I scroll down uh, who you can go see under the uh, get help tab. Um, there's so much, wow, there's so much uh, power here and knowledge and big names across the board uh, that you can reach out to people and either they can help you directly or remotely. Um, and, and that's one of the things I love about IC is that they do do that. Um, you know, Mary, I know you're a, a big part of, of this organization and I, I, I tried to do a Google search. I typed in uh, Dr. Mary accurately on Google and like the first eight pages is all about Mary. The, you, you have such a positive influence. I didn't, certainly didn't see anything bad in the, in the screening I was looking at. Um, in this society. Um, I know people can reach out to you, but I just want to give us a small plug, a way of saying thank you if I can. It, it, how do people reach out to you? I mean, can they go to your website? Or I mean, I, I, last time I heard you, um, you're, you're in high demand. So I don't know if how your, how your operation works. Um, I have now two staff members, one of whom also works for ICI too. And um, that um, they actually, I, I'll tell the story I'm very proud of, is that they have listened to me for so long that recently somebody called, and I do a lot of consults. My interests really are more specialized in a sense in working with um, brain disorders. So I work a lot with um, psychosis, psychiatric issues, autism, people who develop depression out of the blue, dementias. And I, I should point out, I think now 30% of boomers are being said to have Alzheimer's by their 80, uh, mid 80s. It's, um, and part of that is definitely fueled by the lead we had crawling around, the toxins, the food we've eaten, and mold and lime are very big parts of the Bredesen protocol in trying to restore brain thoughts. So anyway, going back to is you call and um, Angela or Susie will pick up at the terrific and um, somebody called, they had a 20 year old daughter who has been diagnosed with Lyme and Bartonella and have been four years on quadruple antibiotics. This is on the East Coast. And uh, she was functional enough that she could sort of go to college. She was still pretty bothered by severe depression. Um, and every time they started to jiggle, this is four antibiotics for those four years, um, which does a lot of damage to the gut and the brain. Um, and she, every time they'd start to move her off one of them, she'd relapse, become more psychotic, have auditory hallucinations. One of my staff members actually said, well, Dr. Ackley is going to want to know what your ERMI score is if she's talking to you. The woman in four years, that practitioner had never told them about mold. Right. So she went and got micometrics, you know, which say go to micometrics and do the dust test. And at least you can tell Dr. F she's going to say, what, are you sure about mold here? Um, the woman did it. She read it. She talked to King, you know, someone at micometrics who said, well, your home has more, a le more mold than 90% of the homes in the U.S. She then went on ICI and read some of this stuff that mold could turn the brain on fire and fuel even auditory hallucinations. She had already gotten in an IEP, said, well, that water in the basement has caused a lot of issues. And this was before I even saw it. it was, that one was, I think, only about a four, four week wait. Lots of times it may be three months beginning earlier, but I am really proud yeah. that my staff had done what this other medical practice using antibiotics for four years should have done said right. do you think you might have mold so anyway that's you know and that's the power you, tool that they went on IC too and they they connected a few more dots to learn right You're and not they got an IEP who said right. yeah you know that basement you know with that water is probably that source and they had already looking for a place to the girl out to a safe to get remediation I think I had them call you Mike to just talk about it because I don't really trust everyone in the country. Mike is trying to develop a certification and a code of ethics for IEPs so that when you talk to them, they respect the health-related aspects. They don't do an air test and say, oh, there's nothing there. Ignore the other, other ways we have of testing, especially spore testing, not look for hidden leaks or look for places where it might be behind the walls and not getting into the air. Um, who are supporting the fact you're searching for 
an illness that's severe um, and respect that. So I think, Mike, we have to really, you know, take our hats off that you're trying to get um, that level of professionalism and respect for health and cooperation, you know, respect and cooperation between people who have a lot to offer each other working together in complexity. So um, my and hats are off that. to what you're trying to do too. It's a big yeah. deal. No, and I, I, I appreciate that. And, it, and, and, it's, and it's easy to do, again, when you're working with like-minded uh, individuals. One of the reasons why I'm uh, so incredibly excited to be a part of this organization. Um, another reason I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this conference again um, coming up. Uh, you guys can learn more for those of you who are listening but not able to watch. Uh, that's ic.org, uh, I-S-E-A-I.org. And uh, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Mary, uh, just Google her. But um, her website is mypassionforhealth.com. It's my passion, the number four, the word health.com. Uh, and you'll learn more about uh, her. Um, Mary, thank you uh, for taking the time to not just highlight IC, not just highlight what it's there for, but being a big part. Um, you know, I know that my 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 word may only be worth a few cents, but I work with clinicians across the world and you, you, at the end of the day, it's certainly you want somebody with the knowledge and the passion, but it's the ability to connect the dots. And I think that Mary uh, represents that um, ability with a lot of the clinicians that are a part of IC because inherently in the conversations they're having, you can see it on a day-to-day -day basis on, on listservs and things like that, just communicating. And it's such a it's such a powerful theme, albeit I'm sure it can be overwhelming. There's so much demand. It's like there's not enough Marys and Mikes and, and all other names that are out there. There's so many uh, people out there that are more brilliant than myself who can, can be of help, but IC is a great organization. So, um, so thank you uh, for taking the time, and maybe we can chat again in the future. I'm sure we will be chatting again yeah. in the future, but I like that. That kind of sums it up. It's an organization we're trying to create, an organization of professionals who can connect the dots in a in chronic and complex illness between the symptoms, the illness, and the environment in more than mold. It's what's causing this patient and what we have to do on multiple levels to get this person back to a state of health that they would be enjoying and deserve to enjoy if it were for some environmental toxicity that's been poisoning them unaware for years. So it is connecting the dots that's so important. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, thank you again, Mary. And again, check out uh, IC's website, check out the conference coming up and um, thank you again for your time. We'll talk soon. Okay, have a great weekend, Mike. this show is for informational purposes and represents the sole opinion of the host and its interviewees only. Any reliance on the information provided in this show is done at your own risk. Additional opinions and or research may change our current view of the topics spoken in this show. We do our best to minimize any inaccuracies presented and make legitimate efforts to back all comments with our own field experience, independent literature, or studies that support the topics discussed. This information should not be used to make conclusive decisions regarding your health or exposure. Ultimately, all questions and or concerns regarding your health should be addressed by a qualified physician. Additional exposure concerns and or questions pertaining to the health of your home or building should be addressed by qualified and on-site professionals. Any and all products and services discussed in this show should not be construed as a recommendation, endorsement, or guarantee that their use is appropriate for your situation. In short, we hope this information is of value to you, but please do not act upon it without actual and individual consultation and guidance by professionals who have taken the time and appropriate collection of data to assess your unique situation.